This is one of our festival's writer to writer programs where two authors who are already fans of one another's work talk about their new books, their writing lives, and anything else that strikes their fancy. And the rest of us are lucky enough to get to listen in. They'll talk for around 45 minutes and then they'll take audience questions. And now I'll turn things over to Jeff and David who can get things started by introducing one another. Um, Jeff and I have known each other quite a while and we've done a number of events like this as well as ordinary social events. And I would say that knowing him and reading him have only confirmed the thing that I think I most like about him, that he is mysterious. Um, his credentials do not lead you to expect that. He was born in Cheltenham in England in 1958. And Cheltenham, certainly then, was a very posh place. I don't think Jeff has ever made any claims to poshness in his background, but he's from a sort of rural city in England. And now he is a man of the world. And um, he teaches at USC. He says he's gonna go back to England in three years as if he believed in the schedules of planning that that supposes, and perhaps he will. Um, he is an extraordinary writer. Um, we were talking just before we came out here. And I said, and I sort of said it to be amusing, I hoped that we were both writers in different ways who are beyond editing because we put things down and we put things down in such a way that it's very difficult for anyone to reorganize it in an orderly, edited, sensible way. And there are a few writers in the world who are sort of doing that. And I think of Jeff as uh, a brother in that. He's written about jazz, he's written about D.H. Lawrence, he's written about the First World War, and now he's written about tennis, you would think, although tennis is just a ball that sometimes flits across the court of this book. This book is about everything I think that occurred to Jeff and that he encountered, broadly speaking, in the time of COVID. Uh, and I've now read it twice, and I think it's going to be one of his most lasting books, but deeply mysterious. And, and I long ago gave up having a sense that I could pin Jeff down in my mind and place him. He is elusive, mercurial, and it does remind me that Cheltenham, once upon a time, was a home of espionage in England, in a big way. Yeah. And I just wonder if Jeff is not everything he seems. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff Dyer. Well, uh, <laughs> very, uh, very cleverly and cunningly done, David. Um, and yes, as David said, we've um, known each other quite a while. Our friendship began in that way that is uh, um, guaranteed, actually, to make people like you. And I wrote him a fan letter. Um, and the occasion for that fan letter was um, his uh, biographical dictionary of film, which we've uh, spoken about on stage many times. And actually, I mean, the, one of the differences between us is that um, I don't feature in David's new book, but he features in my book. Um, I'll just read this quick line. Um, uh, there's a line in the dictionary where it's a famous line um, where David says that Cary Grant was the best and most important actor in the history of the cinema. Uh, at the time, that was a, a quite a, a sort of a, a extraordinary claim. And this is how I reply to that. Yes, that might be more hotly contested than the claim that Roger is the greatest player in the history of tennis. 
but it's less contentious than the one I'd make on Thompson's behalf, that his dictionary is the great literary achievement of our time. Uh, and um, I, it's funny, when I read about David, and they always describe him as uh, you know, the preeminent writer on film, uh, I always object to that. Uh, because I feel it doesn't do him justice, because I feel he's so much more than a writer on film. It seems to me that that's a, a, such a limiting way, limited way of describing what he's, what he's up to. And um, for me, I mean, it's, uh, the dictionary means so much to me, but there's a danger in which I think that sort of monumental work, um, you know, it's what, 1,200 pages of two columns, so that's kind of you know, 2,400 pages, maybe that casts a shadow over the huge amount of other books that uh, that David has, has done. And uh, we're going to speak today about his most recent book, Disaster Mon Amour. But I always think it's good to remember that a few years before the dictionary was published, he published a, a biography of Lawrence Stern. And it seems to me that uh, there's such an interesting point of uh, comparison there. I mean, the dictionary, the biographical dictionary, through its subsequent uh, iterations has become a form of autobiography. And there's other stuff that I'd like to say in, uh, uh, about David and, um, uh, and where he comes from, but this will work best, I think, if I put it in the form of a question. And if we go to page four of the, the current book, there's something that I'd really like to... Uh, this is going to be one of those conversations where you get to sort of eavesdrop as it were on a the kind of on a conversation so David says here one of the reasons I'm so happy to do this event is because I, I so rarely get a chance to say this David is actually older than me um, as he says here I'm 79 that's a mishap maybe waiting on worse and this this is the line I'd like to start with I'm English by birth education language and every instinct and that's so interesting to me so uh, two questions david do you yeah. still feel you're writing in english rather than american and what does it mean to be english by instinct i think that's such a such an interesting phrase yeah well i can't stand by everything in that quotation <laughs> because i am 80 one now, so you know, time passes. Um, we've taken not dissimilar paths. Um, as a child and a youth, I was infatuated with America. Uh, and that was a matter of jazz and even sports. My father took me to a baseball game in South London when I was about 10. I couldn't understand the game, but I knew it was a beautiful game. Um, and it was the movies, obviously. Um, long before I ever thought to say, well, Cary Grant's a, a great actor, I just wanted to be with people like Cary Grant. I wanted to be on the screen. And, and that was a very American thing, I thought. And, and I, I always thought that America I knew geographically it had a claim to reality, um, but it had always seemed to me a screened place. And as you say, rather against English instincts, um, I chose not to go to Oxford. You did go to Oxford. I'm not blaming you for that. Did you choose not to go or did you fail to get in? No, 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 no. Thank you, Thank you very much. I was in. And I couldn't stand the idea of another three years of that kind of process. So I went to the London School of Film Technique in Brixton, where you lived for a while. And I sort of had the idea that I would make films. And it was a terrible school. It could and should have been sued by the collective student body. But um, for me, it was an amazing time and place because... I got to be with people who were older than I was from parts of the world that I'd never met people from before. And we just started shooting film. And um, it was an incredible experience. And, and I felt my instincts 
changing in that, in that I think I was born and raised and educated in a firm belief in reality and being responsible to reality, living in it in every kind of way. You, you crossed the road when it was the time to cross the road. You married the kind of person that was the kind of person you should marry. I never had a traffic accident, but I had a marriage accident. Um, and America appealed to me as this idea of a totally unreal place, a fantasy place. And I still feel myself battling with that uh, issue. And, and um, I know that you, you live in Los Angeles now, but you plan to go back to London. And I find that an extraordinary prospect. I don't know what, how you could do it, how you could reclaim yeah. that sense of realism. So how are you going to do it? Well, uh, can I just respond to a few things that you've said? First of all, I like this. You, know, you remember when I was asking what David meant by English by instinct. And it turns out what that means is that he, by, uh, it means that he was instinctively drawn to America. What a, what a great definition of, uh, of, of an English instinct that is. And I think that's also quite telling. As you know, the, the main plank of Brexit was fear of immigration. You know, they're all, they're all coming over here to, to, uh, you know, to our little island. And we were all saying it's full. But what, the, what they didn't say is that although, yeah, there were a lot of people trying to get in, in Britain there's also been a whole load of people uh, heading for the exit, wanting to get out and come here to uh, to America, to, to California in particular. And, you know, we could trace, you know, we're, we're in the footsteps of all sorts of people. Uh, I, you know, um, Isherwood, I mean, anyway, there's, a, there's an endless uh, stream of people. But in, in sort of my own uh, case, in terms of this this question of, uh, of England and returning there, uh, I've been getting some advice from a, 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 an immigration lawyer and accountant and he was saying that um, you know quite a lot of people decide to go back to England he said I really advise you to, uh, to, to to make sure you've got American citizenship he said people go back to England because being in America has this result of making you rather idealize England and then you get back there and you find you can't actually bear it so uh, and it seems to me that's very English as well, which links up for me with I mean, this is a, a line that means so much to me. I mean, D.H. Lawrence has been a huge figure who, of course, was born not very far from where I was born in the Midlands and uh, famously came to uh, to America, lived in uh, lived in New Mexico happily for a while. And then, as is the case with everywhere Lawrence went to unhappily for a while. But there's a line of his that means so much to me where he describes himself as English in the teeth of all the world, even in the teeth of England. And it seems to me that's, uh, that's, that's uh, as, as much of a, a sort of, that's a quintessential sort of the, the English uh, feeling yeah. of, of, of dissatisfaction. But um, what I'd like to do is maybe move it on from here a little uh, bit, David, as we uh, approach um, this matter of last things and Right. Um, it's uh, let's go back to. Um, uh, I mean, there's this. Uh, there are lots of problems with the dictionary. Uh, you know, uh, we've all been so infuriated by so many of the things David says in that dictionary. But I have an additional problem with it when I've been trying to teach uh, teach it with students. There's an entry in it that I can never read without uh, without without crying and um i'm not gonna and it's please, such please don't no no i'm not gonna it. not gonna yeah. do that but there's a there's an entry in it um and uh, i'm not going to tell you who uh, who the entry is about uh it's incredibly moving and it's in about it's in about the third edition where david laments the the loss of his uh, uh, uh of his friend and says he was the best friend i, I i've ever had and I fear that for me, uh, the movies, uh, the movies are over now. He's gone. Now that was in the third edition, um, and you know what are we up to now? Edition number six, six or seven? Yeah, six. So um, you know, do you, uh, if you maybe you could say something about that particular claim you made and the extent to which you feel it's 
contradicted by the way that you've uh, uh, that you've um, managed to get another four editions yeah. uh, of um, posthumous life out of the, the movies. Well, this is a huge issue, and and I'll be as cogent with it as I can be. But I realize now that the movies for me were not so much the particular stories or the particular people in them. It was going to theaters in suburban South London, which by today's standards were huge. I, I regularly went to theaters that held 2,000 people, and it was full. And uh, I remember queuing, being in line to get into many films and being turned away because it was full to bursting. And I, I think I feel now that the, the sort of passion that existed between the brightness on the screen and the fantasy and the dream that it had and the resolutely undreamlike mass of gray people in the dark, all of whom were smoking, by the way, and going to the movies then involved sometimes lying back in your seat and just looking at the projector beam. We don't have projector beams anymore. They were fabulous things. And the projector beam was swirled with, with, with smoke as if we needed some indication that it was a very dangerous place to be. But increasingly over the years, I, I have lost interest in saying, well, that film is good, that film is not good, that film is great, which is kind of silly. And trying to ask questions about what being in the audience meant. The movie audience was one of the last forms of community I think we'll have. It was a place where people huddled together, laughed in unison, were scared in unison, looked at newsreels, and just got away from that reality that they lived in. And increasingly, I am drawn to that feeling. And I miss it terribly. And there are great films being made, and they are like great novels and great poems and songs being written in that they are for a limited number of people. And I do think that from about, let's say from about 1915 to let's say 1960, there was a chance in the world that everyone could see the same film and be amazingly moved by it. And Chaplin was, was person who felt exactly that. I, I'm not a huge Chaplin fan, but Chaplin believed movies could save the world and that everyone could be as rich as he was by that time. Um, it didn't work out that way, obviously. But, you know, we're all having a great time now, more or less, on the couch, in our room, with dear ones, watching amazing material. The best movie material made now, in my opinion, is long form series. They're not all good, obviously, but when they're good, they're amazing. But we watch them sort of alone. And I loved that feeling that we were watching them with strangers, a mass of strangers. Yeah. Well, what about, let's go back to uh, something that I, I know what I'd like to do. I mean, so we're, rather than there being sort of organized, uh, well, no, organized let's not be reading, organized. No, there's a, but there are, what I'm going to do, it, I mean, it's, it seems to me this would be quite a, a fruitful thing to do. Uh, I'm going to read this little passage um, in order to generate uh, another, another question. So uh, this is from a section of the book. It's a book about last things, all sorts of last things, and this is um, this is a uh, this will generate a question. Uh, so the section is called "After This, I'm Out." It's a cliche of thrillers: the bank robber plotting or lured back for one final heist. 
I'm thinking of the scene in Heat when De Niro gathers Tom Sizemore and the rest of his crew to ask if they want to take part in an already compromised and risky score. They all, for different reasons, say they're in, but there are numerous other examples. In every one of these, the chances of success are not just slim, but irrelevant. Like Peckinpah's Wild Bunch, they go ahead even though they know that it will result not in a fabulous haul of wealth, but in failure, imprisonment, or death. That, even though, in the previous sentence, is, mis is misleading. They go ahead because of the near guarantee of failure. Now, this is not an original or profound psychological observation, but I am going, I went ahead with it anyway, because I like the idea of all those unseen, because unmade films, in which a criminal mastermind or some member of his crew decides to stick rather than twist. He quits when he's ahead. The film then concentrates not on the score with its predictable and bloody denouement, but on this person's happy, contented and law-abiding domestic life. There are no regrets or doubts, nothing and no one turns up, as in David Cronenberg's A History of Violence, to shred the comfortable present by the excoriating claims of the past. One morning, drinking coffee at his home in Santa Monica, he reads in the newspaper about how, as the result of an anonymous tip-off, police foiled an attempted bank raid that resulted in every member of the gang being shot dead. Unlike the paper, his expression is impossible to read. I like that, but then I want to push it further and do without both the tempting offer of a last comeback and the prior criminal career. How about a film concentrating instead on a thoroughly contented life with no violence or crime lurking in the background? The life, that is, of most people in the audience for these last roll of the dice films, for whom such films are part of the culture that, that reconciles us to our uneventful lives and eventual deaths. So here's my pitch. A man in his 60s, living in the suburbs of Paris, who has dutifully attended every film in a complete Eric Roma retrospective at a cinema in Paris, is getting ready to go to the final film in the series, Full Moon in Paris, a movie he's never seen before about Pascal Augier moving into her boyfriend's apartment in the boring suburbs and her frustration at having to catch the last train back after parties in the city. And then, just before he's due to catch the RER into Paris, he decides to stay home. So, um, uh, I wonder if you, uh, uh, if you share my, uh, to the extent to which you f share my fondness for these, uh, for these, as it were, eventless, eventless films, or if you've, uh, yeah, just wondering what your sort of patience quotient is, I guess. Well, Many years ago, I wrote a piece for Sight and Sound, I think, on happiness as a subject <laughs> in film. And I sort of came to the conclusion that there was a profound instinct in the medium to resist the placid, tranquil nature of happiness and more or less it was easier, certainly for men, to be happy if they were killing other men or robbing banks or driving a huge herd of cattle across the United States, as in a film like Red River. Um, I, I'm very drawn to films about Bartleby-like people, Herman Melville's character who would prefer not to. So whenever he's presented with a sort of critical decision, and it could be anything from whether he wants a hamburger or, or a hot dog to will he marry that man or that man. Um, he says, well, I prefer not to. I mean, that's enlarging Melville's story. But that ethos I find enormously attractive. And I, I, I try to spend more and more time as I age doing nothing but watching things go by. I'm not very good at it in my wife in the front row is probably saying under her breath, is he kidding? Um, he gets up so early to do something all the time. But I'm very drawn to doing nothing at all. And 
you know, there are there are films. Roma is, is an example, but it was in Renoir sometimes. There are there are moments in Renoir where really nothing happens, uh, and, and I love those moments in film. But the business, and supposedly the audience, does not love them. Um, if you've been watching Ozark. Uh, you may remember that at the beginning of the fourth season, there is a very strange car crash where the family, the four birds, forgive me if you don't know the series, you should, you should know it. Um, they're driving along, they're listening to the car radio, and nothing is happening. And it has a wonderful charm, a very rare charm in Ozark, where usually something awful is happening, is about to happen. They have a car crash, and the, the, the wit of the show was that we didn't find out what the car crash was until months later, until the second part of the last season got played, which is just happening now. And then, when we discovered what happened, nothing had happened, because the four people get out of the car as if they're just getting out of a car that has stopped and parked. There's no bruising, there's no abrasions, no blood, let alone anyone being killed. In a crash where the vehicle, if you remember, turned somersaults, and it was really a spectacular crash. Uh, a crash. Uh, so I, I, I do love those things, and I think there is something in the nature of the camera that loves st stillness. After all, that's what we talk about. And once upon a time, movies were just stills strung together. And you've written so eloquently about photography. And I, I think you have the same feeling of this enigmatic moment. And uh, I find that more and more films these days are crowded out with stupid action going on. Mm. And um, there's a lot of films that I don't go to see and I should, I suppose, but I don't go to see because I've, I've learned to be afraid of the, the noise and the din and the frenetic quality. It's, uh, I remember when I, what a great realization it was when, for me when I realized that actually in films, the punch-ups uh, of all, punch-ups are nearly always a bore, aren't they? Oh, Partly terrible. because they're so entirely unrealistic. Yes, you know. and you know, you can just close your eyes and listen to the... Yeah, yeah. Because that really is how the scenes like that used to be put together. It's the soundtrack of blows, incredibly huge blows, which don't do very much more than leave a little trickle of blood at the corner oh, of the mouth. Exactly. And you, and you re people recover from them very quickly. That's right. Yes. Um, that passage that I read earlier, it then moves into another passage where, and this, uh, as I say, it's a book about last things, not just last things that uh, artists uh, do in their careers or uh, last acts in the lives of athletes, but also cultural experiences that we come to late in life. And um, uh, straight after this passage, I, uh, where I talk about the guy who doesn't go to see this Eric Roma film, I say, well, but what if uh, it was a different film that he'd failed to see? What if he'd failed to see The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, a Powell and Pressburger film, which I uh, only saw for the first time during, uh, during the pandemic? And I then reflect on the way that, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to read another long passage, but I'll just say this about it, you know. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I think, I mean, I'll ask David what he makes of this film, but um, uh, this is what I say about it. Uh, this great film does not need me to sing its praises, but without doubt, I needed it. The extraordinary thing was that I'd been able to go about my business, living a normal life with this huge blimp-shaped hole at its center. For all this time, I'd been an incomplete person. What if I hadn't seen it? Well, nothing in the same way that nothing happens if you don't read Jane Austen or listen to A Love Supreme, but your, lo your life will be defined in some ways by these and other lacks. Athletes routinely speak of being able to compete at a high level. The strange thing about these huge, huge cultural lacunae is that one can function. Okay, compete, 
at a high level of cultural cognition and discernment, while lacking what one belatedly realizes is a vital component of that cognition. I should have seen Blimp years earlier, but there is, I suppose, something appropriate about the way I was seeing it at something close to the age of Blimp himself, at the film's beginning and end. So two questions for you there, David. Yeah. I'm very interested to learn of what your own experience of Blimp uh, is. And also I'm wondering if there are things like that that you've that your uh, any of these lacunae cultural thing experiences that you're aware uh, of not having had, and which God at your age you really need to think about having them pretty soon, don't you? Don't you think? Very tactfully put. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, to go to your second question, um, I've been obsessed with Orson Welles since. Well, since I saw The Third Man, when I was far too young to see The Third Man. And I wrote a book about him once. And um, Wells had many, many unfinished projects when he died. He was a very untidy genius. And um, there was one project that was close to being finished called The Other Side of the Wind. And it was a film about a film director who was played in the film by John Huston. And for years, there were attempts to recover the negative and to restore it and to release it uh, as, as a finished film, the last film of Orson Welles. And in my book about Welles, I, which was before the film had been released, I begged for it not to be released because I said more or less, the idea of thinking about this film, imagining what it might be, is going to be so much richer than the film itself if it ever comes out. Boy, was I proved right. <laughs> the film came out a few years ago, and, and it had to come out, but it doesn't add anything, I think, to the greatness of Wells. Um, I would like to see the ending of The Magnificent Ambersons. It was about half an hour supposed to be on the end of the film. Uh, and RKO, who owned it, apparently dumped the footage deep in the Pacific. So I don't think it's ever coming back. And I would like to see that. But I love the idea of a film that you are never going to see. And if you, were, if you came to me and took me aside and said, oh, have you heard about the Hitchcock film that never got out because the censors simply would not let it out? And Hitchcock grieved over it terribly. And the fact that he had been frustrated and denied in it, I think, I'm putting words to him, intensified the feeling in a film like Vertigo. And, and, and would you be interested in seeing it? And I think I would say, well, of course I'd be interested in seeing it but I'd love you just to go on talking about it. <laughs> I'd yes. love to, to, to retain it as an imagined thing. And I do think there's an immense charm and allure in, I don't know, with a musician, with a, a jazz musician, a, 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 a session of recordings that got lost, you know, and this happens quite often in that world. And they come to light and they're great. But the idea of one more Miles Davis Coltrane session. Boy, you know, that is a, that is a dream to drive you on. That's, I mean, that's like ultimate fuel. That's, a, that's like some island in the ocean that, that is enormously appealing. As for Blimp, I saw it long before your age of seeing it. I think it was a great film. Um, I, I, I remember crying in the film. There is a scene in the film where Blimp's, well, the central character, he's not Blimp. Clive Candy, his German friend, played by Anton Walbrook, um, gets out of Germany and he is shattered because of what has happened in Germany. And there's a scene where he is asking to be allowed into Britain, I think, as I remember it, probably set in Cheltenham, like <laughs> where, where he simply talks about what it has been like for a decent man. And it's one of the great speeches in film. In addition, 
Deborah Carr plays three women. Yes. And but um, actually, I mean, I uh, it's in this book I talk about the way that I start crying in the middle of uh, the, that scene. Yeah. But actually, the bit that so he gives this speech to uh, direct to the camera about the uh, you know the uh, the cost to his to him and his family of right. the Nazi regime, and that's that's kind of intense. But for me, the the bit that has me dissolving into tears, they've sort of said to him rather in the sort of like the contemporary uh, treatment of uh, potential Ukrainian refugees. They say, no, you can't come in because your papers aren't in order. And then at that exact moment, Clive Candy bursts into the, the room and he's taken a really long journey to get there. Yeah. And they say to him, well, will you stand surety for this, you know, for this German fellow? And Clive Candy says, uh, with, you know, something like, absolutely, with, every, with everything I have, sir. Yeah. And it's this beautiful expression of pure kind of compassion and, and friendship. Great moment. And that's what I find so and, deep. And, and, and Roger Livesey, the actor who plays Cap Candy, is superb in it. And did you know that it was nearly Laurence Olivier? Who we wouldn't have been moment. able to bring Couldn't that have done kind of it. Generosity Couldn't have done it. No, yes, no, yes, no, exactly. Yeah. He'd, he'd have brought something inappropriately Shakespearean that's to that right. uh, That's right. That, yes, uh, yeah. That yeah. Uh, by the way, David, of I, course, I, I want to throw a question at you. Um, talking about last days and endings, um, if you had been informed early in the morning when you woke up that this was your last day, what would you do? Oh, uh, I'd spend it exactly as, as we're doing now, yes. Uh, you would? Yeah. You'd be on a platform yeah. talking to me? Yeah, pretty much, yes. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, yeah. Really? Oh, I have no re no regrets on this score at all. Um, but are there uh, other places you would want to be for that last day? Well, I mean, it would depend where I could get to. You know, no, well, I, mean, it's, uh, I can get you wherever you want right. to go. No, I think I can uh, cut, and you're yeah. there. Well, the um, no, this is this is fine. Yeah, I know it's fine. Yeah, but yeah. where would you want to be? Well, no, we're here. No, I'm really, you know, um, you know, it's uh, um, yeah, this is this. Well, yeah. it may work out that way. Yeah. As we seem to be on platforms yeah. like this from time to well, time. Well, two can play at this game, David, because, yes. uh, of course, you've just, in the, your pre previous remarks, you uh, I think you just, this is the, these are the lines I, I, I'm going to pay to have inscribed on your gravestone that you just uttered. Boy, was I proved right. <laughs> uh, I think that'll be, a, that's, a, that's a great, great line. Uh, I'm going to do another of these things of a question in the form of a quotation from my book, which is so rich, you see. It provides uh, fodder for, uh, for, um, for every kind of discussion. This is a very brief, um, uh, brief passage. Uh, I talk about the way that you, uh, one can give up on reading books. So uh, just a bit of background to this. You know, I read uh, volumes, I read five volumes of Anthony Powell's dance to the music of time. Anthony Powell, you'll note I'm pronouncing it, Powell was so snooty that apparently one time when he, uh, during one of these very cold British winters, the plumber came round to fix a burst pipe at his house. But when the plumber knocked on the door and a Powell answered it, uh, the plumber was rude enough to say, is this Mr. Powell's house? And so Powell, who was uh, you know, in a house with a burst pipe, said, no, no, no one of that name lives here. <laughs> Extraordinary thing. Anyway, I read vo f five volumes of Dance to the Music of Time before giving it up because it seemed to me so entirely devoid of value. And that leads into this passage. With books, you can usually tell after a couple of chapters if something is terrible. But what about films? How long does it take for a film's lack of quality to become apparent? I would say about 30 seconds, sometimes less. The opening shot can be enough, but typically you need two or three edits to discern the lack of any hope of rhythm, to perceive that, 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 that the director's vision, if one can dignify it with that word, has been entirely determined by, and possibly even aspires to, cliché. I have a special fondness for those occasions when the silent kettle drum of the opening claim, a film, by X, intended to announce the start of the latest work by a self-identified auteur has torn itself to pieces by the time the credit sequence has unfolded. 
In books, there's always the possibility of later transformation. Film is an unforgiving medium. There is not even the possibility of redemption after the first botched minutes. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why redemption is such a stalwart of cinematic plot and theme. Uh, so I wonder if you, uh, if, you, uh, if you go along with that and if you, make, if you feel that you can make your mind up definitively about a film as quickly as I claim. Um, I don't know how to deal with that. It, it, it's, um, it's, um, I'm going to pass on it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is that all right? Um, I take that to mean that I was right. <laughs> Boy, was he right. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to read a short passage. And, um, early in the book, I sort of explained the title, Disaster Monomore, by talking about Hiroshima Monomore, the film of 1959, and how you see two lovers in that film, and they pass through the stage of being almost made of crystalline lava. It turns to flesh and sweat, and it, it's, it's a great love scene, such as I don't think anyone would attempt today. But then I cut, and I cut a lot in this book, and it seems to me that the cut is one of the most profound gifts cinema has given to us. And I go to this passage, which, um, and I will say something about it at the, at the end. Um, May the 6th, 2020. People are celebrating the anniversary of victory in Europe. Although few were aware of it as yet, on May the 6th, 1945, Hitler was dead 75 years ago. It was said that things would return to normal. But of all the people alive in 1945, none lives on like Hitler. The tread of monsters is heavy in our sleep. In the 2020 room of pomp with flags and an aircraft carrier desk, a president is holding an audience with healthcare workers. This is as close as he will get that day to a hospital or a morgue. One nurse, a head of nursing, is admitting nervously that protective gear can be sporadic. She has worn the same mask for weeks. The president looks at her, and then, as his slowing wits realize what she is saying, he turns away, rejecting her. He cannot be seen attending to her or her experience. He denies what she says. He has been told other stories. But we need to notice the bestial gloom in his sunken face, the sullen misery, the childish folding of his arms, the way in which he is not getting his way. This is hideous. We had elected evil, his only talent. Oh yes, that was long ago, before he took to the road when we should have seen he was an act, the bully, a surly dinosaur, such a fraud, we were stupid to be afraid. But fear can conquer reason. Um, the publisher of this book told me that they would not publish the book if I added the little thing that I had added, which was to say that if I was in the same space as that president, old and feeble as I am, older and feebler than he is, I would attempt to kill him. Because I believe that would be the most humane thing anyone could do. And Disaster Mon Amour is a book with a lot of humor in it, but it's a lot of terrible stuff, too. And um, I just want to say finally, that we joke about disaster. I talk about 
the way we laugh at disaster in films, whether it's Laurel and Hardy or a film like San Andreas. And we laugh because we know we're on the brink. And um, last days means a lot. Oh, God, that was well done. Well, it was time, wasn't it? That was perfect. We've, My we've done word. this before, I think. <laughs> so that was uh, the alarm to indicate that it's uh, uh, time for questions, if there, if there are any. Well, we can't let silence remain. Oh, there's a so, question coming. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to take issue with the notion that a film's got to be great in the first 30 seconds because you're obviously someone who enjoys movies and I hate them. But I will occasionally sit through 30 or 45 minutes and then something extraordinary happens and then I understand why someone like you can exist. So. <laughs> There's that to consider. Not really a question, but... Yes, uh, th thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Um. I'm going to throw a question at you. Um, have you ever written a book where you did not set out with the feeling that this is probably my last book? Oh, uh, well, um, uh, what I can, when I was on a panel like this where I was interviewing John Berger, who has uh, been such an important figure for me, and I quote this in the book actually, I sort of say to him, he was, I think he was about 80 at the time, and I said, you know, did you have any idea, you know, how have you managed to have a life of such relentless creativity? And he went into one of those Berger like trances, which I I know you're familiar with, with David because you've seen him speak a number of times. And he said, well, how have I written so many books? It's because I believe every book will be my last. Mm -hmm. And my own, so that's, uh, you know, that's uh, said with a kind of uh, magisterial quality. But I have some version of it that uh, I always feel that I'm, I've, I've been saying to my wife for all the time we've been married, which is 21 years, that I'm completely finished as a writer. And it's certainly, I'm convinced that it's my belief that I'm finished that's kept me going. And she says out of her breath, is he kidding? Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, so I think a, ver a version of that. What about you? I mean, you, you're very unlike, I mean, the other thing is that I, this will generate another question is, I never have contracts to write books. I never do proposals. I just write them because I can't bear the idea that I'm obliged to write one. Right. And then I hand it in and hopefully somebody takes pity on me and publishes it. Whereas you don't mind having this weight of contracts and uh, obligations hanging over you. So you well, the, the lesser weight of money that comes with it is quite a pressure in my life. I see. So, yes. But you've, I mean, when we were speaking beforehand, you said you've got three books that you're... Yeah. That are, that are and I, I, I know that is a way of delaying the end. You know, uh -huh. Because if yeah. there are books to do, then I think I'll do them. Hmm. I may not, but, but I, I stock them up uh -huh. as projects. You're, you're, getting, you're getting over COVID at the moment. And yes. are you, but you seem to be, uh, I don't notice any diminution in your abilities. It's funny, that with, uh, with writers, I think it's, I'm going to hand over to you, actually, because you, you have a question. Or was that just a gesture, sir? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Oh, great question. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the films I saw beneath the projector beam full of s smoke were invariably pretty bad films. It didn't make any difference to my experience, but I, but I, I have 
gone back to some of the films. And, and there is a film from 1949 called Samson and Delilah. You can imagine what it is. Um, and it's a terrible film. Um, but I think it affected me deeply. And every time I go to the barber, which I don't need to go to that often, I get a trembling feeling, which I, I know comes from Victor Mature's ordeal in that film. So I enjoy going back to old films, but then you see, well, God, I'm really gonna come clean. Um, I recently rewatched Laventura with my wife. And Laventura was a key film at a certain moment. I mean, it was emblematic of, are you gonna be serious about film or not? And I, at the time I said, yes, I am gonna be serious about film and Laventura is a great, great film. Uh, and it was in 1960 for me and for many others. Not anymore, I'm afraid. And, and um, you just have to learn to live with that. And I think it's very common in film because Films, films depend a great deal on the moment they are released. Um, Lillian Gish once said to me, um, if you weren't there, the weekend intolerance opened. And I wasn't, obviously, it was 1916. <laughs> You're never going to get it. And she was right, I think. And you know, even now, something will sometimes come along and capture the world for a weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that quality. Yeah. Um, yes, I'll just quickly uh, say that uh, two things. One, uh, yeah, I had a similar experience that David describes with Vim Vender's film Wings of Desire or Wings Over Berlin. When I re-saw that open air in Berlin, it just seemed awful uh, uh, to me. It seemed rather sort of pious in a way. On the other hand, though, I mean, uh, I think I'm at, in terms of, uh, I'm in the re-reading years. And, you know, recently I reread Middlemarch, a film that I, uh, a book that I greatly enjoyed when I was 20, when I read it. And, you know, you reread it and it turns out, wow, it's even greater than you could have imagined yeah. when you, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, you know, it's, it's um, yeah. you know, sweet. Yeah. Yes. Two questions. Uh, one, what did you think of, West Side Story, the latest version of West Side Story. And I haven't read your book, but wondering about the Roger Federer connection. What's that all about? I'm having trouble hearing you. Yeah. You, we, you could what's the no, I wondered, Federer, wondered. What's the Roger Federer connection? And then the, you, want to hit, you, you want to know about West Side Story? What you thought of it, yes. The new film? Yes. Um, shall I take it? Yeah. Um, we went, my wife and I and our son and his girlfriend all went together to see it last Christmas. Was it last Christmas? I think. Yeah, yeah, last Christmas. And um, I was very dubious about it. And we had a ball. We had a great, great, great time. And, and, and I had no instinct to write about it. I didn't sort of want to take it that seriously. But uh, I just love being present at the song and dance of it. So I'm a fan of it. Yeah. And your question to me was, what's this book of mine got to do with Roger Federer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, well, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, um, yes. Tennis fans. It's not, uh, it's not really a, a book about Roger, uh, but I think he's uh, an, uh, a, an important figure in the book because there's been all this discussion, you know, should he retire? And, um, uh, but the thing is, he shows no urge to retire because it seems to me that he just loves playing tennis. And he came to terms with this uh, fact that he maybe wasn't winning uh, 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 Grand Slams, was maybe not going to win anymore. But everything about the experience uh, he, he liked. And then I think what happened is that we were grateful that he didn't retire because we would have a chance to see him. And you contrast that with these people. For example, Andre Agassi famously said in his autobiography that he actually hated playing tennis. And for different reasons, Bjorn Borg found it intolerable. So I think it's just this interesting question of what causes a person to, to, to give up. So that, I mean, what the book, this book begins with my memory of being on this camping trip when this 
legendary footballer, George Best, decided to uh, quit uh, football at the age of about 26 so that he could um, do what? I mean, essentially, he wanted to, uh, you know, he just felt football was getting in the way of doing what he really wanted to do, was drinking, you know. Um, and he then, sure enough, he basically devoted the rest, you know, he, he made multiple, uh, made several comebacks. But it's this sort of interesting thing of when you when you give up on, on on something. And, you know, now that we're in this very interesting thing with regard to Roger, will he come back for what is going to essentially be a processional last appearance, a kind of, uh, yeah. you know, a, a notional thing? Because I think there's very little chance now of somebody, however great he has been at 40, coming back and, you know, how could he resist the relentless charge of the 19-year-old Alcaraz? Yeah. There's a great passage in your book about Boris Becker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so he's been in the news recently. And, uh, you know, he, of course, he's a sort of ridiculous figure. And he's, and he's as we speak, he's in jail in England. Um, and it's so easy to see him as a sort of tragic and comical figure. But, uh, you know, the, I'm also absolutely convinced that the value of a life can't be assessed chronologically. So the important thing is not just how you spend your last hour on earth. So it seems to me that, you know, Becker, you know, he'd won Wimbledon three times by the time he was 22 or 23. Yeah. That's already a great life. And then you think of somebody like Kerouac, who spent the last however many years of his life as a sort of bloated, drunken buffoon. But it didn't matter because he put so, he staked everything on, on the road uh, being, uh, you know, written and published. And then also, you know, there's all sorts of manifestations of this where people do something that's, I mean, we're, we're living through it now, really, aren't we, with Emma Raducanu, the British tennis player. You know, that incredible, that it's, it's the nice thing about being a writer is that you can keep doing it, uh, possibly with diminished ability. And very often you're, you, the writer, are unaware of the diminution in quality, which everyone else is so conscious of. Um, but yeah, you uh, you know you you can it's uh, the the life of the athlete is particularly cruel like that. But yeah. then it, it can happen to our, I talk about to Kiriko in the book who had this great you know creative phase um, you know which was over by the time he was about twenty six or so. He lived till he was ninety uh, doing art of either a very uh, obviously inferior kind or he was reduced to. Uh, to doing these knockoffs in writing, I guess the version of that which I was so conscious of writing the book is you can succumb to uh, a form of self karaoke where you become your own sort of tribute act. Uh, is that it? Or yeah, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you.